Welcome to Westside Barbell Podcast. Today's topic is the forced posture curve and the need for partial lifts and accommodating resistance. Louis, can you please begin by explaining uh, the forced posture strength curve? Uh, yes. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for tuning in. I want to talk today about what Tommy said, the forced posture strength curves. What, what is it? What does it mean? Uh, the maximum strength a lifter can develop depends on their body p p uh, posture or joint angles. Uh, the maximum force that can be generated in slightly above is slightly above the knee, you know, in Olympic lifts or even deadlifts and so forth. Um, the lifter can only exert a certain amount of force that that depends on the body position or posture. Uh, we all, you know, we've all gone through this. Everyone has sticking points. And so uh, I, want, I want to bring up a graph. I mean, it, it illustrates it pretty simple. Um, and, you know, a lot of people think as barbell get higher, force gets greater, but actually it diminishes somewhat. So if you, if for those of you that have uh, practice science and strength training, you could go to page 40 and look at the graph. Um, you know, it's figure 220. Um, this was taken from Strength and Power in Sport by Comey. It's one of the best books I've ever owned. It's hard to get. Uh, it shows the amount of maximal isometric force that can be developed to a bar at 10 different positions. Uh, force grows until the bar is very close to lockout. Now, if you look at the graph, for all you people here, this is Olympic lifter, of course. Uh, now, the Chinese always talk about they do a lot of pulls at the very high position on the hip. This is why. You see, when he starts out the floor, the amount of force he can develop um, is uh, 200K. And then as the bar raises, the force increases. But when it here, you see, as the bar is at mid-thigh, it's highest. When it's slightly above, it starts to go down. This is where a lifter would jump underneath the bar because the barbell velocity would be slowing down. And so a lot of people have to understand, see, that's the difference between force and velocity. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, force and posture. Everyone's different. No one can absolutely train the same because of length of back or length of leg length. You have to change. Everyone's going to have a different sticking point. Some people can barely get the bar off the ground and then pull deadlifts. That's why I used to be years ago. Others will just fly up to the top and can't lock the bar out. Uh, both very, um, uh, very, very, uh, you know, um, um, uh, very detrimental to the training if you can't figure out how to fix it. So um, if you, if also, if I want to now go to page uh, 29 and, and um, look at, this goes along with the velocity. See, as it will talk about here, as motion velocity decreases, external resistance or load increases. Now, if, if you read this, this is very important. This is where people make a lot of mistakes. This is why strength is measured in time and not weight, because maximum force is obtained when velocity is small. Inversely, maximum velocity is attained when external resistance is close to zero. Remember last week I talked about the release of a javelin. Uh, on top javelin third is close to 34 meters per second. Now you know what a javelin is, a few ounces. A shot put weighs 16 pounds. Their release is around 14 meters per second. And for powerlifting, when we do our speed pulls at average weight at 80%, uh, the average velocity on that barbell with a common resistance is 0 0.8, 0 0.9 meters per second. So as, as resistance grows, velocity slows. Um, and you, you, if you look at the, go back to the chart, you miss where, um, you know, it's a mini max. You're going to miss the bar. You're going to miss your lift when um, a sticking point is when uh, you're putting out the, uh, you have the maximum amount of resistance, but the minimal amount of force can be generated to the barbell. So this, this is how you get stuck. So this is a call, basically caused by muscular force, which we talked about. Muscular force goes right along with joint angles. Um, so I, now I want to get into what about doing full range? Everybody does full range. We have to full squat. We have to f complete bench, <coughs> deadlift, power clean, power snatch, and so forth. But now, uh, what about lifters uh, that only train full range? You'll never get to, if you can only get the bar to knee height from 500, how can you get stronger? You need to lift as much as you can. That's why you have power racks. Uh, for instance, with the plates two and a half inches off the ground, I could deadlift um, 705 with a four and a half, 730, six and a half, 760. At that point in my career, I had a 722 deadlift. Now, when the barbell went to the floor, I actually had more leg drive to generate against the bar 
to cause it to be lifted at a greater velocity off the floor, which would cause me to be able to lock out more weight than actually all pin, um, uh, pin one, where the uh, place is two and a half inches off the ground. Our worst case here scenario, we have a 900 pound deadlifter and with the plates four inches off the ground, he can only pull 810 pounds. He uses extremely amount of leg drive. So when we raise the bar off and put it into his back muscles, he the barbell comes way down. But that is the lift that's going to get him a, a over of 900, not deadlifting off the floor with 900. Uh, you have any questions, Tommy, so far? Um, back on the sticking points, a lot of people believe that the sticking points are universal. Is this true? A lot of people think you stick on your chest um, on the bench press or you stick on the bottom for a squat. No, like I said, it's not true because the length is uh, it's biomechanics. It's the length of the spine and the length of the, uh, the the upper leg, basically. That's the difference. And, of course, sticking point caused by weak abs. You have to be able to maintain posture as well. You know, you see a lot of people deadlift with arch back. Well, I know a doctor is going to say that's the way to do it, but that's not what happens in real life. So, like, when you do a power rack deadlifts, a lot of people will get in a power rack with the plate six inches off the ground, arch their back, set their legs, and leg drive it up. In the real world, when you get the bar six inches off the ground in a real lift, your back is going to be bent. You have to, at that point, straighten up your back. That is the need for why we do bent over good mornings. We have a good morning machine, and we do hundreds of uh, bent over exercises here. So just remember, uh, the, as, a, as a, the joint posture graph showed, um, you know, uh, the barbell will change, the strength will change at different positions as the bar is raised in any lift. Um, so what happens is you're going to come to the, like I talked about a moment ago, your mini max, or what everyone else knows it as a sticking point. Now, I, I want to apologize to our readers because I know most of you is going to know this, but then again, there'll be a lot of, a lot of listeners that don't know this. So you, you know, know these things. Uh, years ago, George Halbert and Kenny Patterson combined for about 25 world records in the bench. And um, one thing they discovered, George was always working on the triceps. You know, we wear gear. Now, George raw bench 625 at, two, at 235 on one of my tapes. He also benched 550 to meet at 198 in a T-shirt. So, you know, um, strength is strength. But George found out that a lot of people could not lock out as much on four or five or on four boards as they could three. Or they couldn't do as much on three as they did two because they used momentum out of the bottom with the back launch. And um, so he found out, see, it's just like this graph says, the barbell went higher, actually force diminished. And also the muscles start to be isolated. At the very top of the lift, it all turns into triceps trying to lock the thing out instead of all your muscles moving in in the very beginning. So that was a, that was a need for four and five board press. And it, it made everyone's benches go on up. I mean, I, I think we've had... I believe we've had six people break world records in the bench. So just for instance, um, you know, uh, so that's how, that's it's things we learn over the years. And then again, of course, other people start, you know, on the force uh, posture curve, they will start standing on boxes. This is common for Olympic weightlifters uh, overseas, uh, stand on a box. And that's what I recommend in my book, because that it, then you have prolonged leg drive. So you, you've got to start from different positions. Um, so, um, you have any, you have any questions, Sir Tom? Um, does this strength curve differ from the novice to the elite lifter? Um, can you change that over time? Uh, by muscular strength. Okay. Uh, the idea of the conjugate system was to do small spatial exercises. You even such as good mornings, back raises, uh, inverse curl, uh, calf hand glutes to build to fortify a weakness. Because once you you're getting stuck uh, biomechanically, actually by your weakest muscle group. It does no good to be real strong in some muscles if some are very weak because that's what you will be limited. Uh, you know, you can look at like a classical clean and jerk. Um, if we just look at the basis of it, I know there's six phases that uh, Russians believe to, the, to this, but if you talk about two poles, the first pole and the second pole, then you have to front squat it, then you have to jerk it. Whatever you are weakest at in those four phases, that is the maximum lift you are limited to. You could front squat 500, but if you can jerk 400, you only got a 400. Mm. Or you could you could clean, um, um, you know, whatever it is. the the smallest The smallest part of that lift is going to limit the amount of weight you can lift in the classical clean and jerk. So it's very important to uh, bring up all these weaknesses. Without doing that, you're never going to get anywhere. If um, 
If I'm a deadlift, I was weak just at my knees. Would it benefit me to train in that range from that sticking point? So just say if, if that's pin two in a rack, um, is it benefit to change in that partial range of movement or should I be trying to go through the full range of movement? Uh, actually, uh, the experts say you want to train a sticking point by starting slightly below the sticking point. And I've also found everybody goes, oh, there's no need for speed. You know, when you lift heavy weights, they move slow. But uh, dynamic method is for a fast rate of force development. I've got my top, some of my top lifters believe speed training is the most important thing, even over max effort. Me, I believe max effort. But if you're, you know, the barbell, you miss a lift when the barbell slows down. You have only so long to strain. So at some point, if, if you can strain for two seconds and the barbell is not completed, you miss. So the faster you become with certain weights, uh, the sticking point is eliminated till a heavier weight is, occurs on the bar. Okay. Now, we... We, we talk about, remember the graph. Uh, no wonder people came up with a power rack because, you know, you have different, you're limited at different angles by how much you can lift. That's why people do power rack lockouts from different pins. And um, we never do regular deadlifts. We use three different pins and enormous amount of bands on the bar, uh, three different band tensions, 170, um, 250, and 350 in power racks. And for the most part, 220 and 280 when we're doing floor deadlifts. Accommodating resistance. Now, you know, years ago, um, this brings up, you know, maximal strength is displayed isometrically. So, Bob Hoffman, years ago, um, in the early, in the 60s, came up with a power rack. It was close together, the, the, the rails, they were round, and they were about a foot apart, had two sets of pins. So, we'd put the bar on the bottom set of pin and pull the bar up to the second set of pin and hold it. This is isometrics. Um, he, and then so you built the strength at that joint angle plus they claim 15 degrees either way. So this was known as the Hoffman method. When you pull a, a bar from one pin or press it off this pin to the next and hold it, that is the Hoffman method. And too many people, or should I say not enough people in this country do isometrics. Um, the, the Russians did lots of isometrics <coughs> for two or three weeks and then they would get off of them, come back, and they worked all type of, of, of positions. Uh, one of the major things I found out by John Quint, and also um, some graphs that uh, Tom, you gave me from overseas on uh, isometric training is, it, it has uh, a zero or very little uh, inflammation problems. You don't have the inflammation built up by full range lifts because the muscles aren't lengthening or, or shortening. Yeah, there, there's no tissue glide because there's no motion occurring, so there's no tension. And on top of it, there's also no joint shearing. So anything, all the mechanisms that cause inflammation aren't going to be present. But you can still train at that specific angle. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? And I think part of it, too, is, uh, let me see if this is fair to say, uh, Lou, is it true that when you're using partials, you're kind of dividing the uh, repetition up in ranges and then training those specific ranges. That's the objective, correct? That's right. I mean, what if, what, how could you ever deadlift five if you can't get 500 up to the top? Right. You have to. Uh, what I do, I train a lot of track girls. And uh, I mean, I got track girls and stuff like deadlift 400, all right? But I found out by putting them in a high pen deadlift and having them maybe work up to, uh, you know, at the time when I started them out, I mean, I'd have them rack pull 365 and invariably their deadlift would go from 280 to 300. As their high pins went up, uh, their deadlifts followed right along with it on the full range of motion just because it triggered the central nervous system, something they've never done. Right. And then it also places their, their muscles in a different tension. Right. So sometimes it's like, like you said, George is training the end range of his tricep strength. Yes. Right. So you're able to start to isolate and hone in on specific ranges that may be considered your sticking point, but you're training the soft tissue at either a super shortened range or a super lengthened range. Or, Does that make sense? Or a range you've never obtained. Correct. With a certain amount of resistance. Yeah. And if you don't train it, you may not necessarily have it. Yeah. You must, if you, remember, what's the greatest method of strength training, Tom? Maximum. Right. Max effort. You have to max effort. I, um, uh, what I've viewed in my gym are morons, and I've viewed geniuses in my gym. The people that refuse to do max effort, if it gets hard, they quit. Oh, it wasn't fast enough, or oh, you know, I've seen people pulling a bar, it would be going upward, and they just stop pulling. Where I've been taught to pull to my eyeballs, pop out, get a nosebleed, pass out. I, we've seen several people pass out in our gym, 
And I mean, I'm not saying this is recommended, but they are putting out a max effort. Um, that's, I believe that's one of the problems with American weightlifting. They never go to max effort. They might do a max effort one, once every two or three months. We max out each week. So if you're used to maxing out and you're breaking new records on different spatial exercises, it's, it's really easy to break the classical list when it's time to do it. Uh, back to isometrics, you know, they would pull basically from three to six seconds holding their breath. Um, I also have lots of data from the old Soviet Union, uh, and this bears why wrestlers are so strong. They wouldn't use maximal isometrics, but they would pull for long periods of time. Now, Tom, I know you've done lots of experiments of fighters, and, you know, I have too, uh, with the, uh, long p a long period isometrics up to six minutes, yep. right? Yep. Uh, we would do a band bar and hold a band bar for up to f six minutes um, or in a belt squat get in it's called a skater's pose um, Everyone you, you you know, you know everyone needs these exercises if you can somehow afford them But you need if you want to reach the top But you get in a half squat like a hockey player and you would just stay in that position for long periods of time Train the positions that you that you um, actually going to be using your in your sport specifics So that's how you you'll be able to get strong like that I found when we did those, um, shoulder pain, everything was dramatically reduced because a lot of fighters from hyperextending their shoulders or elbows, when we started incorporating the bambell bar for six, well, it was about five to six minutes, um, and I, it was quasi isometrics because we'd move up and down slowly. But um, why is that, John? Why do you. I mean, it could be uh, multiple things. One of the things that occurs is when you get an injury, the central nervous system is going to down uh, regulate the motor units that are recruited to that area. And on top of it, too, uh, I think what happens is anytime you injure yourself in a certain range, your body uh, is going to have the stretch reflex is going to increase. And what happens is when you take it back to that range and you start to uh, load that tissue and have that tissue function, maybe in an isometric where it's safe, it starts to function, and then that starts to uh, basically turn online and activate more of those motor units. It shows that it's not painful, it can function there, and then you start to get better overall function in that tissue and also the central nervous system. Thank you. Yeah. Good. You know, there, there are many ways to tackle these problems. Uh, you know, what I'm trying to point out to everyone is, you know, a after speed squats, we could do some, we do rack pulls a lot of times for speed pulls. We don't do always do full range of motion, so we do speed pulls on uh, on two pin heights, uh, right you know pretty far below the in the mid shin or right below the knee, but we move around like that. And wherever you're wherever you're putting out the most force, this is called the law of uh, uh, action uh, action actual situation. Yeah, situation. Thank you. <laughs> and um, but that's good. But what if you never get to that position? You know, so you you got to catapult yourself into this maximal. Um, joint angle that you can help yourself. So that's why accommodating resistance to me is is a, is a better way. And um, so, um, yeah, I know personally for me, you know, I, I'm not a uh, power lifter by any means, but from a bodybuilding perspective, since I don't train max effort, I know I predominantly use accommodating resistance to help recruit uh, motor unit activation and all that other stuff. Uh, and I, I know for me personally, it helps because uh, it teaches my central nervous system to continue fire through the end range of the articulation and it actually has to fire harder at the end range uh, and so you're getting a lot more um, uh, motor unit activation but then on top of it uh, it also feels good on my joints because it decreases the joint sharing at end range you know what I mean I don't I can actually really explode through the repetition and I know that I have a counter force to counter my force so I don't get the joint shearing and pain and all the other stuff yeah, if you're going to do explosive training, it's, it can be very dangerous at using 25% because the bar velocity is so great at the end, you basically lock out your elbows or your knees and you hurt yourself. Uh, so that's what accommodating resistance will take care of. Um, you know, if you look back, why do you need accommodating resistance? Well, way back in, in the late uh, 1800s, Xander came up with an oblong cam, uh, you know, which is later, as everyone will know, Nautilus would came up, come up with the very same thing. And um, so you, uh, it, it works the muscles through the complete range of motion like John's talking about. Uh, so, yes. On isometrics, can I implement those um, instead of a max effort movement or do I do it more as a, an accessory work or could I do both? Is it possible to do both in the same training session? You could do both or you can actually use isometrics as a complete workout. I mean, they're very strenuous. Uh, it's, 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 isometrics got good pluses and bad pluses. John and I were talking about this the other day. Isometrics, 
is a max effort. It makes you very strong. It does not make you gain body weight. So if, if you want to gain body weight, isometrics might not be for you. But if you want to stay in the same weight class or actually maybe reduce your weight class, isometrics are a good thing. It's bad on the circulatory system. That's why we found that a lot of you breathe, it's fine on the circulatory system. Um, could novice lifters or novice athletes uh, em embark on isometric training? Uh, the experts say no. No, they say no, but I've had 16-year-old girls do isometrics and they and for track, I would have it. I would have them do it three days before a meet, and they invariably would break their records on the track by by triggering the central nervous system. Um, you know, much like Charlie Francis would do for uh, Ben Johnson, and a lot of um, um, swim coaches do for the lower body. John, so, would, would you use uh, in your setting? Would you use isometrics on um, younger athletes or older athletes? Does yeah, it, does it... yeah. In in treatment, I treat everybody using isometrics pretty much that has you know mechanical tension or even neurological issues, uh, just because that's the way. Once an isometric occurs, uh, communication between those motor units and the central nervous system, you're able, you're you're turning it online per se, right? Mm -hmm. And you're able to start to communicate uh, mm -hmm. and really make changes in the soft tissue. So as far as treatment, uh, I use what's called pales and rails, which is progressive angular isometric loading. Uh, and regressive angular isometric loading, and I use that in combination with uh, with manual treatment, mm -hmm. right? So that I get both an internal and external force into the tissues, so that I can really make a change in the tissues. But at the same time, what happens if I would go in there? Uh, the isometrics from a soft t tissue uh, treatment perspective enable me to work past the neurological barrier of the stretch reflex, so that I can get down and actually start to manually treat the connective tissue. So it's basic, and then on top of it is uh, basically anybody that I treat soft tissue wise, uh, I use, it's called FR release, but then on top of it, it's called functional range conditioning. And what that does is all the newly acquired ranges that they get from uh, treatment, we're training them using isometrics in those newly acquired ranges. So they have neural drive into the area, they're getting the tissues loaded in that area, so they just don't have this passive range of motion. Like, for instance, like I said, you know, like yoga is more about acquiring passive ranges. If they started to add, add isometrics in there, then they would start to have active ranges, right? But you don't want your athletes to have passive ranges because then it's going to increase the risk of uh, injury. So I use isometrics literally in everybody that I treat. It's crazy because you use isometrics for strength training, you use them for treatment, but today's age, nobody uses them. Do you think it's just a lack of knowledge, or people just don't underestimate, or they underestimate the power of isometrics? Uh, because I think it's old. Like I said, Hoffman came up in the '60s with this, and it was kind of overused at the time. Uh, then I think it, it, a lot of things fall out. Tom, how many jujitsu fighters do we know? Um, uh, judo fighters we know, boxers we know, and they'll tell us that no one knows the fundamentals anymore. That's true. They want to yeah. jump 20 steps ahead, and that's how come they never reach the top mm -hmm. in their sport. Well, and this goes for all sports. Well, it's interesting, too. We talked about it on Friday, and I talked about it with uh, uh, Dr. Shivers. And uh, they, I think the reason why is because the answer is kind of it's, – it's not complex enough for people. It's mm -hmm. simple, and they want a complex answer, right? But realistically, the answer is simple. They just need to apply the methods. And so kind of all the simple stuff is overlooked, but that's the stuff that's been around forever and that we know works. Right, so I think it's just applying what we know actually works. I guess people just gotta educate themselves too. Because you gotta know your history so you can progress your future. And a lot of people sadly in strength conditioning today just just don't bother reading books or they read certain books or they got a biased opinion. Like we're here to build bridges, not walls and sadly stars too. They just write about, I remember a guy talked about squatting three times a week, deadlifting three times a week, bench pressing three times a week. He was from Germany. So I met him at Donald Classic and I asked him, I said, well, I said that doesn't make any sense. How, how did it work? He goes, I never did it. I just wrote an article about it. That's a true story. You got to be careful what you read. Uh, you know, I've seen people write, train at this gym. And then go out and write a book that's contradictory of what they did here that made their greatest lifts. They also went down the tubes very quick too when he left. But I don't understand, you know, I don't do anything to make a dollar. I do everything to educate people. It's the only reason I do this stuff is try to educate someone in the right way. I've had numerous injuries. I don't want to see people have injuries. Um, you know, Dr. Sip, I did seminars with Mel uh, before he passed. And um, 
But Mel would come here and watch us uh, use uh, in the early stages of bands and change training. He was gracious enough to, uh, you know, in power or in uh, super training to give me credit for the, it's called combinations of resistance methods, where I came up with using weight releasers even with bands, because bands would shoot you down faster than without. So we did a lot of uh, experiments, and a lot of people don't even know where bands and chains come from, but they actually came from West Side Barbell, just like board press. I was doing board presses in nineteen in the sixties before I went in the army, and then uh, I, I gave up. I just quit doing them because I didn't have enough sense to build my triceps at the time, like Larry Pacifico told me. But then uh, Jesse Callum, I was talking to Jesse, and he said, "Man, you guys got to do board presses around nineteen ninety." So I give Jesse credit for this. So we went back to doing it. And of course, you know, I'm writing articles and so forth. It caught fired, and everyone did overdid board presses. Uh, you know, in, in our sport and powerlifting, the hardest thing to do is touch your chest and form these tight shirts. We see people all the time never touch their chest. And what's the result of me, Tom? They don't lock it out. They, well, and, or they bomb oh, out. Yeah. They can't touch. Or they can't lock out. It's, it's, just, it's just pure misguidance. So, uh, you know, the real world, you got to learn what the real world is, go in and practice it and do it. Um, you know, another method of uh, basically working the full ranges of motion at a constant speed is isometrics, or I mean isokinetics. Now, nowadays, uh, I had a power rack, an isokinetic power rack. I could do, I could actually do cleans, squats, benches, deadlifts, whatever I wanted to do. It's a constant speed. It goes in Hill's equation of muscle contraction. It has a constant speed, rate of speed, and so it shows when real fast motions at a constant speed, force was not that great. Uh, through a very heavy resistance and slow speed constantly at the same speed, it produced massive force. It absolutely proved what Hill's equation of muscle contraction talks about back in 1937. Some of these men were just beyond comprehension smart. I mean, that's all I could say. And uh, you need to read a lot of books like Super Training, Practice Science and Strength Training, Science and Sports Training, a Sport and uh, Power by Comey. These books, I have I have so many books I can't count them all. And um, so you need to learn a lot of books. But then only, the, but like I, I told a strength coach uh, in the NFL one time, I said, you got, you know, I said, you need to put some weights in your library. You just can't read a book and never try it. You got to go freaking try it. Either try it on your worst athletes or your best athletes, one or the other, and find out what works and what doesn't. Tommy, got questions? Uh, where do isometrics get incorporated um, within a training session? Well, like I say, a whole workout can be um, used for isometrics if you want, because like you want to use normally uh, about six positions when you do isometrics. And you can do several exertions there and then move up. Now, all your Olympic weightlifters out there, uh, you know, the second pole is super explosive. Uh, right, Chris? It's very explosive. It's also very hard for two things. It's hard to coach because it's so fast. And also, it gets very little attention because it's so fast. So if you do isometrics with all these critical joint angles, you can get maybe three seconds. You can get 15 seconds in where you're, you're not even getting a second in when you're doing speed pulls. So that's why it works, and also it's it's a it's a good way for your coach to watch your technique because you're in a static position, and he can find out right away. You know your your position is not quite correct. You can change position, do the pulls there. Did uh when you had the isokinetic machine in the gym, did um was that very beneficial? And did you find out anything interesting from uh, trying it out? Very beneficial. I I let's get out of the world of powerlifting because Tommy, I mean you know that's my love. But it's about 10% of what we do, 90% sport. Uh, there was a fellow with the highest age, his name is George Nichols. And uh, actually, uh, his uh, roommate, um, you know, was afraid. His mom wouldn't let him in my gym, said it was too dangerous. But George was a Big Ten indoor sprint champ. And in 100, he ran 1047. He had drastically would slow down. And uh, his dream was to make the Olympic trials. He was going to go to South Africa after graduation and work with kids. So the high state track coach at the time said, George will never run any faster. I trained a 7010 shot putter, and I was there with him, and we heard him say that. So I, I, I catch George and said, George, if you come with me, I'll make you run faster. He had a 10, 40, 700 meters. We did a, everything we do, bell squats, pole sleds, um, all the speed training at the time. But one thing we did a lot of was isokinetic squats and deadlifts. Well, in nine weeks, he ran 10, 17. I took three tenths off him. 
and uh, and I did. I basically contribute to uh, the Isaac and Egg machine to a lot of it. Then I tried to get it. That it broke. I tried to get it fixed, and over the years, I never was managed to find someone that could fix it. But but they use ice kinetic devices in many uh, college settings to test single joint motions, right? <coughs> like I talked about before, we do many many single joint exercises. We you know it, 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 uh, Olympic lifters squat all the time and they got really terrible squats. Why? Because they do the same freaking thing over and over and over. That's called the law of accommodation. What is holding them back? Um, it could be it could be the back. Most people when they miss a squat, they miss because their back gives up. Not because their legs give out. So whatever we decide, it can be the lower back. You could have 600-pound legs, but 400-pound lower back, you're stuck at 400 pounds. Or you're going to get injured. So we train uh, the hamstrings separately, the glutes and hips separately, the lower back separately as much as we can, and spinal rectors, rectors separately. So we break everything down into portions. And uh, we try to find out, when we come here, we never criticize, we analyze We'll try to find a person's weakness, and then we work on it to the point that that weakness becomes their strengths. So then we have a new weakness, we work on that to bring it up again. I know you bodybuilding, so probably in parts of your, your body, your arms is behind your back, so you work your arms, then your back got behind your arms, then your chest got behind both, you had to work on that. Constantly bringing up your weak body parts to become a top-notch bodybuilder. Well, everything is the same. If you got a football team and you're scoring 40 points a game and you're losing, you got to get a better defense, not more offense. That's just all there is to it. Lou, can I talk about uh, weightlifting for a second? Absolutely. Jack, can you hold that for that? Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, kind of talking about the uh, strength posture, curve or force length, whatever you want to call it, and isometrics, tying it all in. So you can see here, we're starting from the floor, and then as we're standing up, the amount of force the lifter can produce increases. But for all the weightlifters listening and watching, you can see as he gets to the full extension period here and he starts to come up on his toes, you can see that the force decreases. So something that Lou is having me do a lot is uh, fully extended in the reverse hyper, which would be mimicking knee extension, hip extension, and spinal extension, and even hyper extension, and doing a maximal weight for isometrics, which that is maximizing this point here where you can see the force starts to decrease. And we talked with a uh, weightlifting coach who said that bands are a trick, quote unquote, uh, and that's how they work. And that's not true. So if you look at here, again, you can see that in the beginning of the lift, his force is only 200 kilos and at the top it's 320. Can you see this graph down mm -hmm. here too? Yep. So let's just apply it to a squat. So right here at the top is resting length. And you can see at, if you were standing up, you can produce the most amount of force looking at the force length curve. So this is the concentric phase and this is the eccentric. So if we're looking at the contractile elements and we are lowering ourselves down into a squat, or if we're starting in a concentric position in a deadlift, the force that we can produce is lessened. So let's just put a number on it. Let's say this is 400 pounds that we can produce here and this is 600 pounds at the top. So if our limit is 400 and we're only gonna pour, uh, do 400 pound deadlifts, how are you ever supposed to train the tissues at the top that can produce 600 pounds of force? The only way to do that is to use bands, which as you stand up through range of motion, approaching a standing resting length, you can produce more force. The band matches that force length curve perfectly because it increases the resistive load and it gives you a perfect weight at every range of motion. That's why I did the whole year long research study on it. And lo and behold, it shows that I was talking about to you, mm -hmm. the person who did the max squat with the chains versus compared to the bands produced 800 newtons or 8,000 newtons, my mistake, more of force using the bands because of that over speed eccentrics and that increased acceleration in the downward direction compared to just uh, chains. Bands work, I mean, that's the bottom line. You gotta do it for your cleans, snatches, pulls, squats. I mean, it applies to everything. And that's why I'm in super training. <laughs> Um, he brings up a good point, though, about the bands. Um, I have lifters come here. I, I, it does a lot of things. Uh, you can say this, I'm right or wrong, but I'm right. Uh, one of the key elements in Olympic weightlifting is diving underneath the bar. Uh, the greatest lifters in the world pull it the, the least height and be able to get it under. Yuri Vardanian was supposedly the best, and David Rigger is right behind him. Um, so it, I would have lifters come here, 
and put bands on the bar. Basically, I, we think it's around 70 pounds for most guys that get clean in the 300s. And they would work up. I would Like I brought a, a, a fellow in. He had a, a 340 clean from LSU. He's six foot five. And um, stuck for six months, he said. So I told him I could break the record in a half hour, put 70 pound of band over the bar, 75 pounds, and he's six five. So it's quite a bit. But he worked up, I worked him up to 275, took off the band, started over, and he powered clean 365. Because it's teaching those tissues that. It's teaching uh, tissues he never touched before. Mm -hmm. And also, the bands will pull you right back down, like you talk about overspeed eccentrics. Yeah. But so you pull the bar, if you're doing full cleans or full snatch, you have to literally pull yourself and drive yourself under the bar because the bands are pulling the bar down faster than ever. It's faster than gravity. Faster than gravity, basically. Exactly. If you don't believe me, uh, take a rock on your mom's house there at the glass table in the living room. You drop a little rock on the table, don't break. Get you a slingshot, shoot it down. Ma's kicking your ass. <laughs> Same rock, but the, what's the difference? Over speed, uh, eccentrics and higher velocity. I'm going to play devil's advocate here. Yes. <laughs> um, Go ahead, devil. <laughs> but the questions we get, the, the biggest reason that athletes don't want to do bands, especially for Olympic lifting, is they all say, well, it's going to distort my technique or it's going to change the way I catch the bar. What do you guys say to that? It's insane because, um, you know, I, it's hard. I couldn't buy a weightlifter. Tom, I've worked at three pro camps with 40 pro football players. I can't count that what kind of a salary. I've had, I trained a UFC heavyweight champion. I trained with two Olympic gold medal sprinters. I have a nice uh, NCAA hurler in here right now, champion. And um, anyhow, I can get the, I can't get a weightlifter in here. <laughs> so the, if I've had people come in and do snatches and cleans with bands, immediately break all their records. If you brought me a CrossFit girl here from California, spent nine nine weeks, could never qualify for the nationals in weightlifting. Her Olympic coach said, "Oh, you're wasting your time going to one side. Your list won't go nowhere." Well, while she was here, right down the street, 20 minutes away, at Ohio State Championship, she qualified for the nationals. Why? Because she used bands. Her clean actually went from somewhere around 170 to 215. And so this this is a crossfitter. Uh, bring a real lifter in here. We've seen enormous things. Um, I mean, we got a one we got a 165. He had 800 pound squat in nine months. He's already done 860. He's trying to break the world record. We in the gym. He's done 910. He never used bands. He didn't know what bands was. Put bands on these people, they go crazy. I'm gonna I'm gonna touch on the technique oh. thing because I hear that all the oh, time. Yeah, please do. So the only way for everyone says and you hear it all the time, bands set a groove to the bar. Yeah. But that's not true, especially if you set it up in the uh, deadlift platform where you do your cleans and your snatches, and it's basically set up like a triangle at the top. So the only bar that has a groove is on a Smith machine, and the only one that we have of that is a static dynamic, which is totally different. So. With the bands, because it's pulling the bar down faster than gravity, if you are out of position at all, it punishes you for it right away. So if anything, it teaches you how to get into the best position for the weight that you're using. And you always talk about it, how everyone's technique breaks down with maximal weight. Well, yeah, if you're doing a maximal weight and you're lazy with bands, then it's gonna punish you for it. It's not because the band is setting a groove, it's because you are weak and you just learned about it. That's how it works. One of the primary misses in Olympic lifting is not having full extension of the back. And you, when you pull bands, you got full extension of the back or you don't make the weight yep. every time. Like you said, you can't be lazy. Mm -hmm. You have to exert everything. Um, uh, people don't know anything about bands. Uh, I mean, I've, I've lived with bands, experiments. Thomas, you well know. I mean, we got a graph for Circa Max. It's insane. I mean, 83 people up from 800 to 1,200 doing various 2%. But when you're working for speed strength, you use 25%. And then when you're working at very heavy weights, circa max, near maximum weights, we use up between around 45 to 38 percent. And then, and of course, for strength speed, we use more bands than we can get weights on the bar. I understand the amount of bands. These guys go have no idea how to hook the bands up. They got way too much band. Or one guy go, they're good for uh, jerk thrust. No, they're good for jerks. You just got to use the right amount of bands. You, Chris, do you not do it all the time? Do, do you do snatches with bands? No. Yes, it's freaking, it, it's it's easy to do if you, you know, you just, like a, a guy said, you got to much, how much salt to put in the soup to make it taste good. You just can't go do it. No, I tell people, but they don't listen to me. So they go do it, so that stuff won't work. You wear this all the time, right? Mm -hmm. Well, why do we break all the world records and these guys are going nowhere in other sports? You know what I mean? It's it's ridiculous. So the, the biggest problem you and I see a lot besides lack of strength is finishing the pole 
finish the yeah. I I saw it with a girl, and I told you about this time, where she could clean 180, and I had her just try a 35-pound bar with just that one strand of minivan over the top, which is only probably mm -hmm. 70 pounds at most. She couldn't even clean the empty bar. And I told her before, I was like, you're lazy when you clean. That proved it right there. We, we How got, do you go from 180 to not doing zero? We had a six-foot-tall girl come in, remember? Mm -hmm. uh, and this girl, same thing, could not clean the bar with the band. Mm -hmm. But I said, stick, keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it. She must have missed it 10 times, then got 85 pounds. Yeah. But it ended up putting about 40 pounds on a power clean once she got the hang of it. It teaches the yeah. nervous system how to fire more efficiently. And you know, how, like we were talking a couple of weeks ago, right. it increases that frequency and amplitude. When right. you deadlift, you got one pull. So the weights get bigger, what do you do? You exert harder. Mm -hmm. But Olympic lifting, they try to keep the maintain the, the bar speed on the first pull. Well, the problem is, is these barbells get heavier. That actually speed slows down, and they can't get to the proper position for the second pull. Mm -hmm. When you use all this band, Tom, when you go in there, like you mentioned, uh, I, I think you filmed me or something. I was doing pulls mm -hmm. with 350 pound of band tension mm -hmm. in a power rack. You're going to blast this thing up, or it ain't going nowhere. It not only does it build a tremendous lockout, it builds a tremendous start. That's what people don't understand. And like you're talking about the overspeed eccentrics and, and eccentric factor, you can get into to us about the, in the bodybuilding world about, the, you know, we're talking about that. Mm -hmm. But that is the key. The um, overspeed eccentrics, like you said, that's, mm -hmm. like I said, chains were great, bands were greater. I, you know, you, you got to have some brains here, folks, and you got to have groups to experiment with. I've always had a tremendous amount of groups to experiment to do anything I tell them to do. Um, you know, in the partials, and maybe you could uh, get well, into this. Yes. Well, I just want to add. You know, you guys keep saying they say it's a trick, but it's not a trick. It's a training effect. Yeah, it's not. Right. There's it's, no tricks. Right. It's a training effect. So when you look at how motor units are recruited, I mean, right? We were this is what we were talking about. Motor unit kit, motor motor units are recruited in an orderly fashion, and that's based off of the external force that you're trying to move as part of that, mm -hmm. right? So is it if you're doing just a basic bench press, and as you push up to the top and the resistance gets harder you're based off of the size principle you're going to recruit more uh, motor units to do that specifically what happens is small uh, and slow motor units get recruited first so and then what happens is if that's not good enough then the larger and the faster ones get recruited so what the bands are doing is it's it's actually training the uh, central nervous system to uh, uh, fire more e efficiently and that would be the training effect that occurs right when when you leave there so it's not a trick it's a legitimate training effect mm -hmm. right uh yes and you know for us what if there's a drawback to this and tom has seen this while he's been here for his five years in bench pressing normally people blast the bar off the chest get the top they can barely lock it out that's almost how everybody works right mm -hmm. well by using bands all these years we bar we we get the bar going to medium speed and then blast it at the top yep. when we take off the bands and so is that not what Olympic lifters need for the second pull? Absolutely. If you do these freaking bar pulls with bands, when you get up to where you can't budge your weight, you, as a matter of fact, when guys do it, now they're they're doing some cleans to here, take off the bands, now they're about to knock their teeth out with the clean. Yeah. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You just got to learn how to do this, and it can change it can change the this American weightlifting scene for sure. Because yeah, it's changed America the worldwide powerlifting scene. Right, it increases force production, and that force production is due to motor unit recruitment, right. correct? Mm -hmm. So it's a training effect. Uh, you know, like I said, you know, you got to do partials and full range in training. I'll bring up two good examples. Uh, one, bodybuilder, but back then a lot of bodybuilders were American record holders in the bench in the early 70s. Um, uh, Pat Navy and a few guys, but Chuck Sykes was a monstrous bodybuilder, and he wanted to bench 600 pounds. So what he did was he started out, he would lock out heavyweights, in a two inch lockout. Then he lowered the pins like we do an inch at a time till he achieved a 600 pound bench. But he started at the top and worked his way to the bottom. If he'd have put 600 on his chest, where would it have gone? Nowhere. Right. He'd had no range of motion. Another gentleman, in my opinion, if he was from this planet, and he was human, um, Paul Anderson, probably the strongest man that ever lived. I have pictured this guy in the 50s got an 1160 in a pair of swim trunk. And uh, it's, a damn, it's a decent squat. And what Paul would do, uh, it very crude sounding, but he would do partials. He would lift like 800 pounds and he'd stand up f six inches. Then he would put an inch in the pit and put this plywood back down and it would be seven inches all the way up. Then, then he kept adding the bottom so it's getting deeper and deeper and deeper until he could squat out of the bottom. In a Las Vegas act, he would crawl underneath 1160 
three times a, a, a night, five times a week with 1,160 pounds. From crawl underneath it and stand up. What did he use the hip lift? He used the hip lift something. Every day, 3,800 pounds. That's actually why I got to doing all of our heavy hip stuff in the belt squat. Yeah. Then we added deadlifts to why we're doing the heavy hip stuff. And it's changed our gym around. Your body can adapt to all types of heavy means if you let it. But you have to have GPP. If you can't recover or you don't, you know, right now we're going through a phase and I'll tell you, uh, I got a lot of new lifters that get very promising, but their GPP is not high enough. They can make one heavy pull and it seems like they're done. Where Vogel pull or me, we were forced to because we always bet money. But um, they'll make like a 600 pound, uh, uh, you know, box deadlift stand on box. They can't do anymore. I mean, it'll be fairly simple, but they're done. Where we would make six and then 620 and 640. Uh, after all, power meets or Olympic weightlifting meets, you need three attempts. So you had to be able to do at least three heavy exertions on Max Everett. One, at least, a new record. You got something, Tom? Nope. I think one thing to note, too, is that if you look at organisms, and at the very base of that where we are, um, we all adapt to the environment we're placed within. So if you change the stimulus, whatever stimulus is, your body gives the law of adaptation. We'll have to adapt to that, and we change it up all the time, but that is what progresses training. And um, I think that's where bands are so superior, is because there's this unforeseen force, like the, the way the bands, and you know from your study, the way bands act in the body compared to chains compared to straight weight is, is huge. Like you stand under, we've had, we've had people who went to the NFL come here and said that they squatted 500 on an air resistant machine we put them under a uh, set of light bands with 70 pounds. 140. 140. And they could barely unrack the bar. Yeah. But they it, could do reps. This kid's in the NFL now. Yeah. Receiver. Yeah. That's that's how much bands. The bands have that that unforeseen force that's pulling you down. That um, just, I mean, it it just excites the CNS like no other. Okay. Remember, you know, that's why Olympic lifters mostly pull from four different positions. They ought to add all these different positions in there. And the best way to do it I've ever seen is with bands. I love isometrics with bands. Mm -hmm. If you set the bands up and you press up into the band, and then you press into that band where you can't lock out, and you just keep changing the positions to where you built, is tremendous. And you don't slam into a pin and all that. But you press up into your bands and hold that thing. And like I, that's why we did isometrics with, with the bar, band, kettlebells, Bands on the bar and all kind of you stuff. Did a deadlift too? Yeah, yeah. Hot deadlifts were like that. Yeah. That was tough. And if you want to build a grip, use bands. You know, Olympic lifters want a simple way. They do high pulls without thumbs. Yeah. You know, so you do a lot of that stuff with these bands. Uh, everything. It just, your motor units just increase doubly. You know, you uh, a lot of uh, we've got a guy, at, um, our friend Andrew, but you know, your bodybuilder. If you hook bands on leg, you lock out leg press. You got no resistance. You use a lot of band on leg press. You got tremendous uh, muscle contractions even at the top, right? right. So you're working the, the full range of motion. Exactly. So that's why it's so important to use accommodating resistance and work different angles. I remember watching Arnold Schwarzenegger on the show. He would do like a mass, like 400 pound lap pull down. He'd get it to here, do some reps. Then they'd take off some weights to get it to here, take off weight and then do full reps with it. Basically the same thing. So why do people like this are very successful at their sport do it? Because they, you know, you have, it's called overload and isolation. It's the oldest principle in the world. Nope, I got a question for you here. We all know isometrics. We're talking about isometrics, talking about bands. But your static dynamic machine, static dynamic. How does that compare? Because you've got a static overcome by dynamic motion. If you added bands to that, um, would that benefit that hugely or does, does it matter? Absolutely. Because again, you're going. If you want to build explosive strength, you're going to go to pull 30. So uh, uh, what would that? You know, if you had a 400 pound clean, you only use 120 pounds. So if if you pull on this bar uh, isometrically as hard as you can for whatever you want you to, one or two or three seconds, and release and pull that up, uh, you you would need accommodating resistance at the top to make the thing, uh, you know, completely um, fulfill a lift. You know, to fulfill all the requirements of the muscles to do the lift. How did you? How did you ever come up with that? How did you think of the static dynamic? Well, I, I, because I read about it's the greatest method of strength training. A lot of people don't understand box squats. I don't care what your stance is, whatever box, but you sit on the box, 
you relax some of the muscles. So you're relaxed overcome by, by dynamic motion on the concentric phase, but other muscles are locked in. You have to keep your spine erect, your stomach, everything going to be locked in, so the muscles are static overcome by dynamic. The key is to release the hip, as you well know, and then reflex it. What do you do when you run? When one leg's off the ground, that's exactly what you're doing. You're breaking up the eccentric, concentric chain. So that's what that does. Uh, but if, if static overcome by dynamic and relaxed overcome by dynamic is the greatest method of trick training, I thought, why don't I make a machine? So I made five of them. And they'll be coming out soon. It's going to revolutionize strength training, I believe, in the world. And um, also, relax. Why do you do, you know, you see in, uh, in uh, super training, um, you talk about um, a kinetic energy, you know, catching a falling object. You, our machine can do the same thing. I can set, the, Tommy can lock the machine in, I can, and then I catch it and reverse it. Bah! And that's, uh, that's what, uh, every, everything to me, the key strength in most sports is reversal strength. Why do you, why do you catch this way to go that way? Set a, why do you throw a jab to throw a right hand? Every, why do you wind up to throw a baseball? A stretch reflex. A stretch sure. reflex. Why do you take a couple of seconds to kick, to kick a football? So that's what this machine does. But it's the greatest method because you can build up, like if, if um, um, you know, if you want to pick up a weight, you generate force. It's, it's simple. If you have a force plate machine, you got 500 pounds on the ground, you have to generate enough force over 500 pounds before the bar leaves the floor. That's just basic physics. But what if I, before I did this, I could build up 700 pounds, and then you release, and I rip up the 500 pounds. And it's the greatest method of strength training that there is, and that's why, we, that's why we're, we're doing them. How beneficial is quasi-isometrics? Quasi-isometrics, I think, are very beneficial. Uh, you know, why are wrestlers, I got a lot of wrestlers come in, and I mess with a couple. I remember uh, Kazaki. Kazaka. Three, Kazaka. Yeah. I mean, this guy was a fat 160, but he's world champion, I think, a 119 three times in Greco. So I tied up with him. I thought I was trying to move a Mack truck. I go, what the hell? But I've done this before and always wondered. <laughs> like Big George and, yeah. and John Saylor, you're not even moving these guys. You feel like an idiot when you grab one to them, trying to kick their ass, and, and you can't even move them. You know, they're laughing at you. Matter of fact, um, um, you know, um, who's the Greco wrestler we're working with? What's his name? Ori. Ori. Mm -hmm. Last time Ori was here, I tried to get underhooks. I couldn't even get my hands in, inside to get an underhook on a guy. So, you know, I'm not afraid to be embarrassed. I'm a dumbass anyhow. <laughs> but I just had to try, and that's about how far I got. Because he got so strong at not letting people get him under and constantly stay in that position. Quasi-isometrics make, that's why they're so strong. And, you know, a lot of um, uh, uh, Russians would do f for fighting, of a squat that takes five minutes to get down and up. Try that sometime. It's up simple. Try it. I mean, you made us squat uh, one minute concentrically on the start of the nano machine coming up. And I don't think anything was as CNS fatiguing as that because you're literally you're putting everything out, but it's only moving at minute like, um, inches all the way up. Mm -hmm. But your CNS, uh, man, uh, myself and Joe Dirk did it. We were dead for a week. Yeah. Uh, I couldn't believe like. Even their hands, that's from a squat. It's, it's amazing what the body goes through. I guess just because you can't see it doesn't mean it isn't affecting your CNS. Well, you know, in Olympic lifting, there's almost no um, eccentrics. You just drop everything. You see me lift, they drop the bar. That's why they made rubber plates, you know. And so um, we did, uh, so the Russians would do slow eccentrics. They would, they would do the bars in reverse. And uh, they would have you lift up the bar and they'd say, stop, lift it higher, stop, lift it higher, stop, pull, boom. But then they would have you do it in reverse, and you got to lower the bar that way. And uh, me and Eskel Thomas in the suite that spent 10 years here, we did experiments. We did that in a den of a band, and we, we could barely walk for a week. My freaking feet were certain from doing this, from uh, lifting the weight and then lowering it, you know, taking like 10 seconds to lower it. I mean, it was it was grueling. So, Do you do a lot of band, uh, bands and bodybuilding? I mean, just for... Yeah, personally. Personally, I do. Yeah. I mean, just because when you look at the what it does to the central nervous system, you know, the from my perspective, I want to be able to recruit the most motor units. And when I talk about motor units, if you don't think of, uh, just don't even think of muscles. Think of uh, your bicep is however many hundreds of thousands of motor units. I want to be able to uh, to recruit the most amount of motor units if, as efficiently as possible. And the way to do that is. Uh, like what uh, Lou's saying is to do uh, overcoming isometrics and also yielding isometrics. So I use both of those in combination with accommodating resistance. That way, 
uh, I'm most efficiently recruiting all the motor units, but also fatiguing the motor units. So like for instance, let's say I don't have bands on uh, like a bicep curl. And if I'm going to curl up and let's say I can only get to partial range, I'm still going to train that partial range because those motor units are still firing. Mm -hmm. So I haven't yet fatigued them. So I can do a yielding isometric where I'm holding that and resisting it from coming down, which, and we talked about this, it, it's going to increase how the motor units fire as far as the speed that they fire at because they're constantly firing. They can't overcome it, right? You can't recruit any more motor units to exert more force to overcome it, but it's still trying to stay in that position. So the entire time, it's very taxing, like you guys said, on the central nervous system. But when you talk about efficiency as far as training uh, for a bodybuilding perspective, it makes my train, I'm able to do uh, less volume because the intensity is significantly higher. I will actually do something similar to that with our fighters. We're making them do that um, because I just talked to one of my guys and he wanted to, to build up one rep max or one rep max bicep strength. I'm like, no, you don't want to do that. And I go, why do you want to do it? He goes, because when I lock in a guillotine, I want that guy to go out. Well, you want to hold it in that that movement, in that joint angle, yeah. and you want to squeeze and squeeze. So we got that football, like you said, Lou. We'd, um, we'd get a soccer mm -hmm. ball, put it in, and we squeeze and we try to burst that ball. And they have a competition to see if the first one to burst that football is. But that, by far, will make you a lot stronger than doing a one rep max bicep curl. Why? Because you got to squeeze and squeeze and squeeze and squeeze. Till nothing happens. Right. Yeah. The way that I the way that I look at it is the body only really understands tasks. It really doesn't understand exactly. exercises. Mm -hmm. So the body's trying to output as many motor units as efficiently as possible to do the task. But what happens when it meets an object that it can't move? Mm -hmm. It just keeps sending out more and more neural drive, right? And it doesn't know it's trying to accomplish the task. So that's the best way to train. That's kind of what we were talking about with max effort. And, and, and so you, we, but you were talking about the size principle. Correct. And how you do it through enormous amount of repetitions, right. but we do it through one exertion. Exactly. That's why we get strong and not big, and you, you, you're you bloody strong, but you get mostly big. Exactly. Yeah, so it's the difference in training effect. It, it, it's exercise specificity. You yeah. gotta know what you're trying to obtain. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And I mean, that's the same thing that I do from a treatment perspective. When you look at the strength length curve, like what I do with uh, FRC is I'm trying to capture that entire curve of the individual so that when they go, when they leave treatment, they don't have these passive ranges or these, let's say, un un untrained ranges, that everything is trained. So when they go to into those ranges, they're gonna be able to function in those ranges and mitigate injury. But you do a lot of uh, range most uh, uh, eccentrically, right, where you force it and force it and force it. Talk yeah. about that, please. Yeah, so uh, a lot of the, are you talking about the eccentric neural grooving? Yes. Yeah, so so instead of stretching, so this is something that, that I learned at uh, FRC, it's called eccentric neural grooving. So basically, uh, I, I stopped stretching athletes pretty much for the most part. Well, I did stop stretching athletes and started doing eccentric neural grooving. And what that is is when we're only doing the eccentric phase of the repetition. And people ask me, well, why do you do that? And the reason why I do that because I don't want to stretch any of the athletes and give them these passive ranges or outside of the physiological range uh, of the muscle. And on top of it, you know, it's just like in yoga, you can do a, a back bend. But if I if if you do a back bend with a dead with a do it like in a deadlift, you're doing eccentric contraction while the muscle's stretching. So the objective of the eccentric neural grooving is not just to, it's to lengthen the muscle, but to lengthen the muscle using an actual muscular contraction so that you have control over that and you're going to get more range, right, with the actual load. So you can take someone that does yoga and they can do a back bend, but then if I load a bar with a good morning, they're going to get more, right? That's just basic basic physics. Well, weight resistance is the greatest method of flexibility, building flexibility. Right. You know, everybody, you know, you put more weight on the bar, you'll go lower and lower and lower. Or if anyone's ever used a 5 inch camera, you, most guys can't touch with 135, it might take 315 to finally come all the way down because uh, the same thing. You know, a, another thing on bars is if, if it goes throughout all sport. If you look at track, a sprinter, there's phases, there's three main phases, the acceleration, the maintenance, and the deceleration. Um, and so you have to work on different phases of, of sprinting or you're never going to be a great sprinter. And, you know, you had to work on it, try to lengthen. I remember um, uh, Ben Johnson would start out, he'd beat everybody 30 meters and they'd pass him, then 40 and they'd pass him. But he actually got to where he could accelerate for the first 70, then barely slow down at all. And that's when he was killing everybody in the 100 meter races. 
So you want to look at that. Now, and all you people out there, women actually can't accelerate as long. So if you're working on a 100 meter racer, where we do a lot more maintenance work for top female racers because they can't accelerate as long, that means they've got a longer maintenance phase. And but although we're trying to eliminate the deceleration phase, so but there's a lot, a little bit of difference in physiology between men and women in sprinting. Yeah. Weight training so far, I've trained them all the same, and I've got the same results. Yeah. Just monstrous results. Take note about Ben Johnson. He was so fast out of the blocks. He's the reason that they changed the start system. He'd fall started even though it wasn't a false start. He had a he could contract um, so fast that he would actually beat the sensors. It's pretty cool, uh, Louis. On isometrics, uh, when people perform them, and I just want to put out, I'd imagine there are some dangerous joint angles that you don't want to do isometrics on. Like, would you do isometrics with good mornings? Would you do stuff like that, or would you? I I, I would do the um, sub maximal isometrics that way. You know, a lot of times, a lot of people, God was asking me what I was doing the other day, I was grabbing a bar and I was barely lifting it off the ground and then I put it down and lifted it off the ground. I, I, I locked my back up and uh, so I put all the tension in my lower back and I just maintained 10 or 12, um, you know, quasi isometric reps. I lifted up a couple of inches, lower it, lift it up, lower it, lift it up, working at one range of motion that way. Yeah. Years, years ago, I had a, a lift here bat winning and the uh, first meet he came to, he couldn't deal with 600 pounds. And the second meet he made six. Well, this is a, two, a big 275 pounder. He started doing um, isometric poles, functional, from the ground up to pin one, which is about three inches off the ground. He would pull, touch the pin, hold it, let it down. Very same thing I'm doing without pins. Uh, within two years, he dealt it to 800 pounds. He worked that range of motion where he was weakest and, uh, and then was able to get into his power zones. So I always uh, I look back at that. That was one of the fastest races I've ever seen. So how important is it to work partial range of motions where you're weak, not where you're strong? It's very important. It's the entire purpose. That's right. And just remember, they fluctuate 15 degrees either direction anyhow. A lot of people don't like it because it's a lot of work. You know, a lot of people, Tom, say, well, you can't do the West Side system. What they can't do is the work that we do. Am I right? Mm -hmm. But yeah, people come here. Many, many people come here. I remember a big preacher, uh, Reverend Tony Hudson, came here. He's 370 pounds of muscle. And I was running my mouth, of course, and he was saying something to me. And, and I told him, I had some uh, guys in uh, the Steelers here and uh, Pitt University. I said, that man's a man of God, but he's in the house of hell. <laughs> and um, so when we went to squat, we, we had the same squat time. He ended up squatting over 1,000. Mm -hmm. We had both had a 920 squat, and I was, we was in there with Mike Ruggiero. And he could not do the same bands. Uh, we had a, a blue and a green 375. He could only use 250 pound of band and less weight for the very same reason. He just knew, you know, he had squatted much, but it was massive. He you outweighed know, me by 140 pounds. But I could do the work. He could not do the work. Yeah, another point, though, too, you said it's plus or minus 10 to 15, 15 right? 15. A lot of people don't understand that. Like, that's one of the things that I use for treatment. So if you're treating, like, a tendinopathy and you want to start to increase the load-bearing capacity in that tendon, and let's say it's it's the knee and at, uh, at 100 uh, degrees you have pain there, right? But then you test that joint at 90 degrees and there's no pain. You can start to load the tissue at 90 degrees and you're capturing the uh, 100 degrees and 5 above that. So that's another thing that that's the reason why the so like you said the Soviets used to do it in increments. It's because whatever training effect that you get from the isometrics, you get ten to fifteen degrees above and below that specific angle. Right. And any position, if you did, Chris, if I got you dead at four hundred, which you do fairly fast, when it gets to your knees, it's it's only there for a fraction of a second. But if that is your sticking point biomechanically, if you do isometrics at your knees, you'll become very very strong at your knees. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. There's no reason to have these sticky points if you got half a brain. You just look at it, analyze your training, and you can beat anything. That's what training is. Can Overcoming answer, obstacles. Want to answer some questions that people asked them? Absolutely. Um, are, chair are chair deadlifts a maximum effort lift, or do you do them as a second or third accessory work? Primarily is to teach people how to deadlift, but I've maxed out on it. Phil Harrington maxed out on it. I think it's a tremendous lift. Um, you know, Ethan Pellucci maxed out on it. I did a max power clean on it. Okay, he did a max power clean because you're in a terrible position. You know, if you do a chair deadlift right, everybody, all you novices out there, you'll get a bar up to about mid-knees, and all of a sudden your butt flies out the rear. 
your hips actually have to be coming toward the bar. So that's what this chair deadlift does. When you pick up, I mean, if you get set off the chair a couple reps, and then on the third rep, you take a sound chair, pause, come up, and your butt flies out, you're wasting your time. You have to be able to shoot the hips forward, pull the shoulders back. So, guys, we do both. How is that power clean off it? <laughs> it's brutal. Oh, it's, I bet. It's, it's really hard on your back, but if, if, like, if you're doing it for multiples to work on the positioning, which I think it really helps you pulling against heavy weight, because all the weightlifters out there, when you max out, whether in your meter in training, your chest will drop a little bit when you pull from the floor. So you need to do an exercise that teaches you to pull against the weight, like front banded gamorings or that. But it, it's it's brutal. Like like the Russians and Tommy Kono said, you don't pull with a flat back. You pull with an arch back. Mm -hmm. And this teaches arch back to the, like the tenth degree. Yeah. Uh, accessory work for bench press, which you would say are the most important? In my opinion, it's the arms. You have to do extensions. I mean, tricep rollbacks, elbows out, Jim Williams, extensions. Straight bar extension was always my famous, my favorite. You know, people make, why do they make an easy curl bar? To take the tension off the elbow. But you have to build up the muscles around the elbow. So I like straight bar, but easy curl, pull over and press, French press, and you push them as hard as you can for a, a week or so, and then you have to switch. But you constantly push them up. And at the very end of every workout, they'll do no less in the gym, 100 push downs with a band or in the tricep push down. And then at home, they do around at least 300 a week while they're home. Uh, sec secondary, a lot of people, of course, get stuck on their chest. Here's the thing, too. Everybody trains their, trains their arms at lockout. Your triceps have to start in the bottom, too, correct? So you got to do tra train your I like a camber bar. Close grip camber bar, your arms are in a terrible position, drive out of the bottom. But also, if you stick in the bottom, you have to build up your back. Um, a lot of people um, don't do this. You have to have enormously big back, and including lats and side and rear delts. That's what is going to patter, catapult the bar off of your chest. Have you ever encountered a biomechanical deficit that you could not identify or fix? Me? Yeah. No. <laughs> uh, I've had... A guy told me one time, he says, well, this is my guinea pig. And I said, that's okay. I've had a hundred hogs there. I mean, I've had some of the strongest men that, that ever, I have the strongest man to walk the face of the earth. We've come across many problems biomechanically. We solved them all. What, uh, folks, that's why I make machines. That's why I made reverse hyper, inverse curl. Uh, I made machines to work on biomechanic uh, deficits. That's why I make machines. One thing that you said to me that always stands true that the answer is always in the gym. That you, if, if you're going to find it, the answer is always in the gym. You just have to look in the right places. That's right. You know, and you can be in the gym a tremendous technician, but I don't mean all your guys will be technicians. You've got to constantly force technique. First of all, teach them technique and then concentrate on strength. And a multi-year training system says the most, the key element to Olympic weightlifting is strength. Everyone thinks it's technique. Build technique in the bottom, then you concentrate on t on strength. Uh, it's great to have technique at 70 and 80 percent, but how about 100, 101 percent? Do you have it? Do rock pulls benefit a raw lifter? Absolutely. We got a 915 raw lifter. How's that? He pulls up 970 right below the knees. And... Uh, you guys got to understand, it doesn't matter if you're raw or gear. Uh, it's basically conventional. Matter of fact, I've never seen gear help conventional deadlifters at all. I pulled 670 in gym trunks. I pulled uh, 710 at 195 in a singlet. So, big freaking deal, you know? What would be the best way to squat and deadlift with one leg shorter than the other? Well, first of all, it sounds to me like you have a psoas problem. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, most people have a, they, they think they have a limb length difference, but they really have a discrepancy. And so uh, that can be treated not using orthotics, actually yeah. getting soft tissue treatment done. You'll, you'll be able to correct that. A lot of times it is in the psoas complex, like quadratus lumborum, psoas, iliacus, all that other stuff. So if you start to get into, you know, if you do the basic test, one limb uh, shorter than the other, longer than the other, however, which way, whichever way you look at it, you know, and you get in there and you do some treatment and then you reassess, you'll see that now you're quote unquote aligned. I'm totally against putting um, pieces in the shoes. 
Yeah. I mean, I'm absolutely, you know, that's everybody's answer to everything. It's not really the answer. Right. It's okay. the wrong answer. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can address the problem instead of treat the symptom. Yeah, you, know, you can always check yourself out. Most lifters, if you've ever noticed when they squat, they never have their feet even. One foot is always ahead of the other foot. Mm -hmm. And that there is a sure sign that you have a psoas problem. How would you program for... Oh, I want to bring up, uh, you know, I wanted to say this. Oh, Lou, what do you do when one side of your back pumps up more than the other? It's your psoas. Right, John? Yeah. That's yeah. why you always get blown up on one side, but not the other. And if you do it for years and years, you'll end up like me, a super thick oblique on one side, not quite as thick on the other. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Tom. Sorry. How would you program for a knee that has atrophied and created a single leg imbalance? Well, my knee was bone on bone. I tore my, my ruptured patella in 1991. I wasn't even going to ever power lift again, but I come out of retirement and in 2000 squatted 920, 100 more than I'd ever done. And uh, it's bone on bone, big, big freaking deal. Everybody, you go to doctors, all you need. I've been told I need new knees a dozen times by an assortment of doctors. I don't have new knees and a new hip. I don't have, I, I've still got my hips. You know what I mean? And I, I squatted 410 at 14 years old. And I squatted 730 at um, 63 years old. So. You helped me when I ruptured my left glute. Same deal. Yeah. Yeah. Just train. You know what? Uh, it, it, look, what, it, what it helps joint integrity? Strong muscles. Mm -hmm. As long as I could train my legs, I walk. Uh, I mean, actually, where I was good. I broke my foot several times. I have a little trouble sometimes. But sled walking. Um, Actually, in a plyo swing, it, if I could train my legs, my knees are fine. They're fine. I don't have any problem. The problem is people are freaking get old and lazy. They get a joint problem. The doctor tells the new knees. Everybody thinks doctors are gods. Maybe some are and some aren't. But you can fix yourself. There's too many operations in this country that are unneeded. Yeah, I mean, a lot of times when you're talking about coming back from something where you have an injury, a lot of the, you know, you'll see a lot of people say, well, you have to rest it. Well, that's not technically true. I mean, you still have to have an optimal level of stress going into those tissues so that they hypertrophy and get stronger. If not, they're going to atrophy. And now you got a dysfunctional knee joint and atrophy tissue. So it's not rest. It's you have to figure out different ways to start to load those tissues. And like we're saying here, you know, like we're using this from a, a weightlifting and powerlifting, bodybuilding, whatever perspective, right? But if, if you want to load your tissues, you can load your tissues at home. I send athletes home all the time that, you know, have tendinopathy type issues, you know, some of the sprinters, right, that, that they're, they're, they have weird imbalances due to what they do. Uh, what we'll do, you know, it's like a patella tendon. I, I have them go home and have them isometrically load that patella tendon multiple times a day. That way that we can start to actually increase the load bearing capacity of the tendon, therefore decreasing the risk of injury. And so, so it's not even weights. You mm -hmm. know, what I mean, we're having the we're having the athletes do it by just doing basic isometric contractions. And you're saying uh, I, you told me before that many knee injuries are due to malfunctions of the foot. Yeah, foot. I mean, th that's generally what it is. I mean, you're going to have the knee. The knee is it's kind of the joint that's stuck in between two two really complex joints, the foot and the ankle and the hip. And so the knee really it's going to go wherever those go. So normally a knee in most cases. Generally, if you have if you have pain somewhere, you're looking elsewhere other than the pain because the pain is probably the tissue that is adapt has reaches adaptive threshold of compensation for something else. So you're kind of looking mm -hmm. away from that to see why that's causing pain. Uh, many many girl athletes come here, and and many have ACL injuries. And Tom, you watch the stick a track girl basically not need and in three weeks walk perfectly straight. We had her carry med balls basically against her stomach like a pregnant woman. So she walked, uh, you know, actually, you know, externally. And within three weeks, it, it fixed the whole thing. Uh, you know, I, I got a question. You know, I, I had a shoulder replacement and Dr. Miniachi Cleveland Browns knew I was kind of crazy. And that, and it was almost experimental at the time. Um, and uh, so he never tells me a thing. In one week, I was benching a bar to my chest at broomstick. Then I started adding weight, and in three months, I benched 300 pounds. Now, all you doctors out there, I got a question for you. Why is it when they operate and they'll move your arm in every single possible way, correct? Then they put you in a sling and tell you not to move your arm for eight weeks. Explain that to me. Because we've had people come here try a tricep tendon off. And the guy told me that I can, he said, I can lift two pounds in 
or it was it was four pounds in two months. That's what his doctor said. In one month, I had him benching 135 for sets of 20. No injuries went fully back. Our friend Chickenhawk, very same thing. Um, tore his tricep tendon off with a 615 bench and came back to bench 640. He tore ACL and in six weeks was doing squat sets, an operation, and in six weeks was doing uh, 420 and 120 pound of bands for eight doubles in six weeks. So I want to know when doctors do these uh, operations, why they tell you to keep the joint immobile when you're bending it every freaking direction, like a knee. You'll bend a person's knee if they have a knee injury, 125 degrees. But then they get out of the hospital, you don't do them nothing, they, they, it takes them day, weeks to get to 90. Yeah. Sometimes people never get past 90. Build up that scar tissue. Yeah. tissue so, but, so why do you do that, Doc? <laughs> I know malpractice, I guess, you know. Troy Thomas, get a reverse hyper. There's nothing that does a reverse hyper that's not a reverse hyper. No, you cannot do reverse hypers on a stability ball or anything like that because you have to have your feet well up underneath your face. That's how you rotate the sacrum. John, would you mention just what a reverse hyper does in open chain? What an open chain exercise is? Uh, in regards to what, the spine? When yes. Yeah, so basically it's open chain, meaning your feet are off the floor. So like a lot of people may confuse a uh, back extension where your feet is on the ground and you extend up. That's actually going to create compression in the uh, discs because your feet are on the ground. In the reverse hyper, your feet aren't in the ground, making it an open chain. So what happens is the discs are technically unloaded and then you're using the force of, let's say that you're using a pendulum and you're using it for therapeutic purposes and there's a hundred pounds on there. The, the, that's only a hundred pounds of force, but you're getting a traction. And like I, I talked about on another uh, podcast, when you talk about spinal segmentation, it's like a train uh, going over a hill. If you have uh, five cars, just like the lumbar vertebrae, each car goes over the hill independently. And so what the, what the reverse hyper is doing is it's teaching your lumbar spine how to segment. It's optimally stressing the discs and all the connective tissue and getting movement into those discs. Generally, when you, have a, when you have a disc issue, the disc that's bulging or compromised, that's the disc that's really doing its job and having to compensate for the other discs, right? So you want to make sure that you're therapeutically using that disc and the reverse hyper is a way that you can do to, st to start to get motion in the other discs above and below it so that that disc also has to do less work. How would you strengthen post-cervical fusion C5, C6? I mean, I mean, it's, it's gonna, like a lot of this stuff, I mean, if, if people are interested for, from a therapeutic standpoint of how to, uh, like from what I see and what I do as a therapist, is there's a huge gap where there's treatment and then people go right back into training, but there's no like conditioning. You talk about GPP. There's like no conditioning of the articulation in the joints. And there's an actual system out there. It's called functional range conditioning and they use isometrics. So they use pails, which is progressive angular isometric loading and rails, which is regressive angular isometric loading. I would use those, uh, I would use that system to rehabilitate someone that has cervical issues. Because once again, you're using isometric contractions, and so there's gonna be no joint shearing in the cervicals, which is a safe setting, right? You're gonna be able to start to increase neural drive into the tissues, like everything we talked about. So you're creating a very good environment for the individual to recover. But always consult your doctor before exercising. <laughs> Louis, how long would you do speed pull movements before going into strength training or would you create a separate session based on speed movements? And what would you use to train a lifter to explode well with good power out of a squat without bouncing out of the hole? <laughs> okay, first of all, let's take it a step at a time. <laughs> speed pulls have to be done. You have to train one strength at one time. We do strength speed work on Friday. 25 squats, but, but the reps are between two and five like the, like the Chinese. And then we do 20 speed pulls. We always use bands to accommodate resistance. Then maximal effort work is done 72 hours later. All right, it sounds to me like you're, I, I guess you're an Olympic weightlifter or a roll lifter bouncing out of the bottom. You should really never bounce out of the bottom. Um, that's why we do box squats. To sit on a box and overcome inertia is how you build up three minutes strength. Um, 
So uh, you want you have to build up the strength on the on the eccentric phase. Now the Chinese weightlifters they do their squats controlled. They go down and some of their squats are even pause. They'll pause on the last rep a lot of times. Did, did I answer all that? Mm -hmm. I'm surprised. Okay. You know. Okay. So just train one strength at one time. If you want to build, uh, what is the expression of explosive strength? Is jumping. If you want to be explosive, you have to jump. It's not Olympic weightlifting. I don't know where this ever came. All every damn football coach in America does power cleans to build explosive strength. It has nothing to do with explosive strength, just as you're using 30 or 40%, which is not enough work to knock down a girl, let alone a lineman. <laughs> so you, uh, you, you're going to have to do some real work. But jumping is the key. How often and when do you implement jumps into a powerlifter's training? Uh, if your guys aren't lazy, they need to do it twice a week. And we've never, it doesn't seem to matter when. Uh, but we like to do 40 jumps a week, mostly with resistant ankle weights, um, weight vests, kettlebells, combinations of all three. And we do a lot of setting on the box, jumping onto a second box, seeing if we get the best results. As you well know, Tommy, we do a lot of kneeling jumps. Um, this, uh, we get on your knees, you set, you set your butt down on your heels, and then jump onto your feet. Um, we watched a guy use 310 pounds of a bar on his back. We had a 132 pounder come in here today and said he did it with two and a quarter. So that builds explosive strength. Those exercises I thought came from Olympic weightlifting. I started doing stuff like this uh, way back in 1970, but it first came from dance. I was informed that by Dr. Romanoff of Pose Method. How should isometrics be used for the bench press and deadlift? Should they be incorporated on max effort or dynamic effort days? You can actually do them throughout the week. That's what the Soviets uh, recommended when they did isometric several times a week. And can they be used as a secondary movement or a main movement? The, if you you can do enough of them, it's a main movement. It's very very taxing, and uh, or you can do them as supplemental. Remember, whatever the second exercise is going to have least value to the first exercise. I personally, when you do isometrics, it's always very important to do relaxation and then uh, motion after that. You want to regain motion because the muscles have been held static, so you want to get lengthening and shortening in there. I believe maybe, you know, for lower bodies, that would be perfect time to do the jumps. Um, can bands be used for beginner athletes? Yes. You know, first of all, teach them form, and remember, use the right amount of band. If you've got a kid that squats 100 pounds, you only give him 25 pounds of band tension. It's hard to be not to not much band tension, but why would you, if you're going to go cross country, why would you start on the wrong road? Start out on the right road. That's the problem in America. Um, children need the greatest coaches. They, they don't have fundamentals in this country. Um, and so they don't know how to run. They don't know how to live. They don't know how to do many things. Um, so you want, you know, I don't know, you get a million co football coaches and wrestling because we've got great wrestlers. They, we've seen six-year-old kids that know how to wrestle. So you want to get good coaches in the beginning to learn the, the techniques. I've ran into problems here when they would bring me young girl track girls. Uh, invariably, they never had a coach to teach them how to run. I make them up powerful as hell, but it doesn't really help until they get a high qualified technical coach. Then everything comes together. Depth jumps and plyometrics for powerlifting? Yes, I don't recommend depth jumps. I recommend jumping up. Depth jumps can be very, very hard on the person. Everything is hard on you in training. So let's do something a little bit less. It's uh, There's a formula called the momentum impulse. And remember I talked about this. If I drop this bottle, if I drop the 16-ounce bottle three feet and hit the ground with 40 pounds of force and it broke, I would rather use... Um, and it accelerates as we're going down towards Earth, right? It's going at the acceleration of gravity near Earth. I would much rather put 45 pounds of effort and jump up and land on a table at zero velocity and save my athletes. Jump jumps are for the very, very elite. Mm. For those of you that do depth jumps, basically around 36 inches, things change. If you jump off boxes 30 or 36 and below and you're a top athlete, the automatization phase is quick, you build explosive power. If you jump off very high boxes, 42 inches, 45, 48, which is dangerous, but it builds absolute strength because on, while touching the ground, it takes longer 
to rebound yourself off the ground. The amortization phase slows, slows, and then you build absolute strength. And people don't think about that, but when you you lower a bench or a squat, you have an optimization phase. By the time you you switch from uh, yielding to overcoming, but no one ever talks about it in lifting, but it's there. The guys with Louis are John Quint and Chris Morang. Louis, uh, how and where to attach the bands in weightlifting? We have a four inch wide platform. It has band connectors, four foot. We have band connectors. We use standard mini bands. For most people, you put the band over the bar, one strand underneath the bar and one over. All right, uh, if you're halfway strong, you know, you would do your speed work that way. And uh, I, I think you could do this, Chris. Um, and then I would use two strands over the bar for my max effort cleans or high poles. Mm -hmm. That's how we do it. It basically is around 70 pounds uh, attention. So, you know, most people, I mean, if they can clean 300, you're talking a pretty good amount of band tension. Yeah, they should be able to do that pretty easily. Right. Please explain how a lifter not on special stop, supplements needs to train or can train differently than athletes or lifters who are on them. I feel this is a very important topic for athletes that top professionals never address. Thank you. Okay, if you look at the West Side system, it, it has something built in, a safe zone. Everything is based off your strength. Drug free, on drugs, man, woman, seven years old or seven years old. So if you base the training off your max strength, you can sit right beside any of my people or any gym in the world and do the very same training. If you've got 300 pounds um, and you use 50% with 25% band, there's no way you can't do 25 squats. It's, it's very, very simple. It's all mathematics. Um, also, for drug-free lifters, um, you, know, you have to look at restoration. Uh, one is drugs. That's what drugs do to recover you. Secondly, small workouts recover you. And also, uh, you know, pharmaceuticals uh, or, you know, uh, nutrition support is a major part of sports training. And then also, um, like John here, therapeutic. You have to have therapeutic man means like water, you know, saunas, water, um, um, hot saunas, uh, uh, ultra red saunas, uh, infrared, um, you know, massage, chiropractic, ART. You need all, rolfing, you need all these things. John, what exercises would you program for someone with a shoulder impingement? Um, with the shoulder impingement, the first thing that I would do is I would address it and actually get it treated so that the impingement is gone. Uh, I would I would look up someone who's qualified in FR release and get that treated, get the joint impingement done, and then what, what you'll get with that is you'll also get a uh, rehabilitation program built into that uh, with this includes controlled articular rotations uh, and all that and, and basic stuff that's going to increase the function and health of the joint and then I would go and lift instead of letting the problem linger I would address it what and, John for the reader what is FR release it's a functional range release it was developed by uh, dr. Spina who's out of Canada and it, it, it you know we're talking about isometrics it's a it's a uh, soft tissue treatment that uses isometrics with treatment right so it's a lot more effective than in my opinion because uh, I have experience doing you know ART and neuromuscular therapy in my opinion it's the best form of soft tissue treatment that is out there because it takes what we know from science and it applies it into treatment just kind of like West Side where where Westside takes what science tells, science tells it and actually applies it to training. This is kind of the same version except for a treatment perspective. Is this the same treatment you used on me last week when you had me in a Kimura? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so so last week, you know, we're training, we're treating, but we're also training uh, Lou's shoulder joint and we're using it in a Kimura and uh, what we're doing is we're training the joint capsule, but all the tissue, but we're trying to get down and train his end ranges of motion so that all the ranges that he has when he goes to use that uh, that shoulder again, he has function, neural drive, etc., all that stuff. So they're trained newly acquired ranges instead of newly acquired ranges that are passive. Does that make sense? So, especially for lifters, a lot of lifters probably don't know about this, but it, I mean that's the demographic that I treat. I mean you're able to really make huge changes in the individuals, not only like joint function but also soft tissue function in doing uh, your treatments with isometrics. It's called PALES, Progressive Angular Isometric Loading.
And, and a Kimura is an arm bar. <laughs> Pretty huge. Um, it's never had one applied on. <laughs> Twenty-five percent band tension for Olympic variations. Oh, for speed work, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And fifty percent of your training f should be for speed work. Seventy-five to eighty-five percent. If you use bands, it's fifty, fifty-five, sixty with twenty-five percent band at the top. And if you follow my recommendations on a four-foot platform, one strand of mini band over top works very, very well. And you can do snatches. Don't let anyone tell you you can. All right, um, I'd like to thank Louis Simmons, John Quint, Chris Morang. This is the Westside Barbell Podcast. I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in. Uh, I'd like to uh, leave you with one question. Um, we are dying.